Okay, I'm going to talk about the global situation, the climate situation, and the global political situation we face um, to kind of frame what we have to deal with. I'm going to paint a picture of the politics and of the climate that is both terrible and with enormous opportunities. And the two things go together. Let me try and explain that. Let me start with the climate. The first thing about climate change that has changed in the last five years is that now, in many parts of the world, everyone knows. Everyone knows climate change is real because it's hotter. And everyone knows it's hotter. In the United States, which was a hotbed of climate denial 10 years ago, two years ago, in a uh, poll, 65% uh, of Americans said that um, there were now extreme weather events because of man-made climate change. 35% of Americans in the same poll said that they had personally been in an extreme weather event caused by man-made climate change. Um, the, it's the old thing whenever you go to a new town and whenever you, if you get into a taxi, you talk to the taxi driver. The taxi driver says it's hotter. <laughs> and from there you go on to a conversation about climate change. It's astonishing the speed with which this has changed. And the speed with which this has changed has to do with the speed of climate change. The, um, to give you a, an idea of the scale of this. In for something like 800,000 years, the world has been going back and forth between steady states of ice ages and instead transitioning into a steady state of a temperate world and then back into an ice age um, to do with the rotation of the Earth around the sun, various processes in that. Um, there's a slow change back and forth from ice age to temperate periods. In the ice ages, there are 180 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Don't worry about what a part per million is, but the number, 180. In the warm temperate periods, like the year I was born, 1948, uh, the, um, no, like 1900, in the warm temperate periods, the proportion of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been 280. So it's a change back and forth from 180 to 280. Um, and 180 most of the world um, is like um, is like Iceland. 280 most of the world is like the south of France. To to generalize. Since the industrial revolution. We have moved from 200, 100, 280 to 405. So the change in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere between an ice age and a warm world is 100. The change with the Industrial Revolution is 125. Of that change that happened with the Industrial Revolution, 80% of that change has happened in my lifetime. 50% of the change since 1800 has happened in the last 25 years. Half of it. The pace of increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is now twice, it's increasing at twice the pace that it was increasing in 1995. There is, a, this is not a long-term glacial process. This is a process that is speeding up, and is speeding up all the time. Another way of thinking about it is that more than half of it has happened since the leaders of the world at the Rio conference in 1922 decided to do something about climate change. Um, since the invention, uh, since all of the, the Paris and the Copenhagen and the Tokyo and the other big international meetings. Steadily, steadily, the speed increases. Since Paris has been increasing. That's the first thing. It's growing. The scale, the scale 
of the effects of the increase in temperature. We're now at an, an increase in temperature, average global temperature of about of just under one degree centigrade. What that conceals, the one degree centigrade, is that is an average of winter and summer. And what climate change has been producing in very many parts of the world is much hotter summers than before and colder winters. And if you average that combination, you get one degree. But the increase in summer temperatures in many parts of the world is a little more than one degree. The effect of that, the effect of that globally, we used to talk about when I first became a climate activist in 2004, I used to talk about what would happen in the future. That future is happening now. And it's happening much faster than I expected it to happen. Um, last week, just to take one example, last week in California there were two forest fires. One in a not very populated area that has killed, so far they've recovered 44 bodies from the town of Paradise, a small town. There's still 600 missing, probably dead. There, um, in uh, Los Angeles, a separate fire led to the evacuation of 250,000 people. Um, I've just come from the United States. I've been looking after my very elderly father-in-law. 250,000 people. When they had the football game uh, with the Los Angeles Rams playing on the television, they told us at the start of, the game, of that game that during that week, 45 of the players and coaches on the Los Angeles Rams um, uh, team had become homeless. The scale of that. And the scale, it's very important that this happened many working class people in that part of um, uh, Los Angeles, but it's a posh area too. People often tell you on the left that climate change, well, it will be all right for the rich because they'll be able to get away, it's just the poor, and people in the poor countries will be affected. This is not true. This is not true. The people in paradise who were driving away, the people in Australia who were driven away from forest fires. Forest fires move, once they get going, they move down through the trees at 100 miles an hour. You drive out of your home and you're fleeing and you're pedaled to the metal in a car. And the fire moves in front of you and incinerates you. Um, you have to remember in all the politics that the ruling class at the top have been for many years split on what to do about climate change. And they're split for a very simple reason. They own the world. They don't want to burn it down. <laughs> they don't want to flood it. When New York City goes, in a big, in which sooner or later the low-lying parts of New York City are going to go permanently in a big, uh, in a big hurricane, with a big hurricane surge. When it goes, one of the first places to go in the water will be Wall Street. Um, that's the first thing. This, so wherever you see it all over the United States now, I'll come back to the United States later, but you see it, it's all over the world. I was in South Africa a year ago working for the South African Climate Jobs Campaign and I was doing talks around the country. I've done talks in South Africa before a couple of times. And the, but these talks were completely different. You know, half of them were different. One half of the talks I was doing, can you tell me when I've got 10 minutes to go? One, one half of the talks I was doing were um, the talks to the to the NGO groups, the trade union leaders, the environmentalists, uh, the, the relatively well-to-do people in the country, and the people from the development banks. And those are the same sort of talks that I've done before. The talks that I was doing to people in rural areas, um, to working class people, to people, many of whom were more migrant laborers from the countryside, to unemployed people, they were completely different. And they were completely different because at that point there had been a drought in the country for three years. And I did one talk in Durban to a group of people uh, who had come in by bus from a remote area of the countryside, but bought there by their 
struggle against the multinationals campaign, a wonderful little group. And I talked to them for an hour through a translator who translated for me into Zulu. And when I finished the talk, an another group of unemployed people from South Durban came in. And I said, I'm going to have to do, uh, I'm going to have to stop, I said to the people I'm talking to, I'm going to have to stop and talk to these people for, um, uh, for a little bit to repeat a bit of what I've said. And they said, no, you give the whole talk again. We want the whole talk again in whatever word. Never happened as a public speaker, ever. But they sat there utterly paying attention. I didn't understand why, but utterly paying attention. I understood, and when I was finished, though, and we got the discussion, I understood why. What I had said is, first of all, the drought that you were experiencing which led to them having to kill more than half of the cattle, which led to the crops not coming in, which had gone on year after year, which was threatening at that point to leave the city of Cape Town with only 200 taps for a city of 4 million people. 200 taps was what they were uh, going to be down to, they thought, before the rains finally came. I said to them two things. I said, this is, this drought is not an episode. This is the beginning of a very, very bad time. It will get better, the rains will come, and then you'll have another drought, and it will be worse than this one, and then the rains will come, and then you'll have another drought, and it'll be worse than this one. That's the first thing I said. The second thing I said is, um, something's gonna have to be done. You're gonna have to have a living, somehow, some kind of grant from the government or whatever. You're gonna have to have climate jobs in the rural areas, and to get this, you're going to have to march from the American Embassy, which they were not at that point prepared to do. But the most important thing I said to them, the thing that riveted them, that they talked about over and over again, I said, this is not God. This drought is not God. This is climate change. And they said, what they wanted to talk about was how did they go back and tell the elders that it was not God, that it was climate change. These are people whose Entire futures have gone. This is happening now in many rural parts of the world. It's happening in urban parts of the world, in rural and urban parts of the world, most strongly in the Middle East, because those are the hottest places in the world. And the record temperatures of 51, 51 and a half centigrade and so on, have been in Iraq, in Syria, in Kuwait, uh, in, uh, in Saudi, in southern Iran, and so on. But those places, it's kind of an awful, they have suffered from the resource curse of oil, which has led to endless foreign invasions by great powers, it led to kind of a torture chamber in every municipality across the Middle East and North Africa for the last 40 years, there's the torture chamber. To keep people down, to keep the control of the oil, to keep the oil cheap for the Western imperial powers. And now, they're the people in the front lines. You can't say that the unspeakable tragedy that's happening in Yemen is because of climate change. The terrible killing in Syria is because of climate change or Iraq. You can't say those things. But you can say that that makes it far worse. It makes it far harder for people to be able to cope. The fact that there were, the people of Syria did not rise, rose up against Assad because that family had been torturing Syrians for 40 years. They had had it, they knew that they were, what the consequences of rising up would be, and they went ahead and they did it. But, but the fact that two million people had had to leave their farms and live in shanty towns on the edges of the city in the drought in the three years before, that was important too. And it's very important that the people in that part of the world, who overwhelmingly urban now, they depend upon air conditioning to cope with these temperatures. And air conditioning, air conditioning collapses when it gets too hot. It collapses for technical reasons to do with energy production, but it collapses uh, because there simply is too much demand on the system. Those are places that are going to become 
um, ghost towns. I could go on and on with the consequences because they're enormous in Pakistan, in Nigeria, place after country after country after country after country has seen the worst typhoon, the worst hurricane ever in the history of this country, the worst floods ever in the history of this country. Uh, millions of people were right, right homeless in place after place after place. But above all, the increasing strengths on the, on the ability of farmers to feed themselves. Okay, that's the scale. And the scale is now increasing very rapidly. Of the 20 hot, um, hottest years in the last several thousand years, of the 20 hottest years have all happened in the last 30 years. The speed is picking up steadily. This is, and it's one last thing about the International Association of Climate Change. Climate change is hitting hardest in the Middle East, in Australia, and in the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. Those are probably the parts of the world hit most strongly by climate change of all. Um, but they are parts, except for northern Mexico, that are relatively insulated because they're not agricultural countries. Uh, because they're not full of small farmers living on the edge. Places like South Africa, places like Darfur, Sudan, Chad, Indonesia, and so on, full of small, Pakistan, full of small farmers living on the edge. A very different situation. But it's global. Okay, now, that's the situation. There is the terrible bit is what's happening. And the good bit of that, the good bit of the terrible bit, is everyone knows. I want to, I'll come back to that, but I want to move on to the global political situation. And here now, we have to look at a terrible thing, which I think is in the back of our minds all the time, about the global political situation. And to deal with it, we have to put it in the front of and that is the enormous resurgence of the global new right. The, it is some, um, it's a new thing. The word fascism may or may not be right to describe what's happening, but it's a very new and different thing. And what ties Putin, there is uh, Putin, Trump, Duterte in the Philippines, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, Hungary, Italy, um, Modi in, in, in India, um, now, uh, and Xi in China. Now, about close to half the people in the world are living with these politicians of, of the extreme right. There are new phenomena, very, very importantly, and this is the thing we have to grapple with, they are, they are elected. Except for Xi and China, they are elected. And they are elected with very substantial working class support, which was never true of the fascists in the 30s. The working class fought the fascists in the 30s. Now, substantial parts of the working class vote for these people. They are on every level, they are held together by virulent racism, by hatred of immigrants, by enormous sexism. Every one of them, Modi, Putin, uh, Trump, um, uh, and so on, they, they're pussy grabbers, to use, um, uh, to use Trump's phrase of himself. That's what they are. And aggressively, aggressively sexism. Um, they are Muslim hate. And they're Jewish. They support Israel and they hate Jews. All of those things together. Um, they are, um, and they're against action on climate change. When you see Trump and Putin meeting, one of the things that the BBC or CNN or everybody never says, never says, is these people, um, this is the leader of the government of the world by fossil fuels. <laughs>
These are the people who will not act on God. The key people are Trump, Putin, Xi, and China. These are the key people. And they have taken us from an era of hypocrisy through the UN about climate action to doing nothing about climate action. Okay. What do we do about it? Well, the answer is not absolute. I've been living in the United States for family reasons most of the last year, and you can see what people do about it once they start to move. The movement doesn't necessarily begin with climate change. In the United States, the movement began immediately after the election of Trump with the Women's March. Women's March because he was an obvious groper and rapist, and because he was threatening a woman's right to abortion. So, an enormous Women's March immediately. That Women's March produced organic movements of all sorts across the United States, over guns, over uh, visas for Muslims, over immigration, over issue after issue after issue. Organic in the sense that it was the demonstrations are demonstrations of teenagers all walking out of their high schools. <laughs> they are de demonstrations of communities. They are organic demonstrations. The academics have counted, have counted 15 million people in the last year and a half on a protest in the United States. Uh, the single most important issue has not been climate. The single most important issue has been sexual harassment and race. The key moment was when Christine Blasey Ford was given the courage by an enormous mass movement to put up her hand and testify before the Senate that she had been raped by a man who is now a justice of the Supreme Court. The effect of that was that Trump and the Republicans lost the midterms. And they lost the midterms because women deserted the Republican Party. Republican women deserted the Republican Party. Among white women, the gap between male and female voters for Trump is 20%. Um, but the result of that, the result of the shift in the control of um, the House of Representatives, was that when the politicians, the elected politicians, came to Washington, um, one of them, or two of them, Ocasio and Cortez, and another um, Native American um, a new representative, went to a protest. That protest was in the offices of Nancy Pelosi, the leader of the Democratic Party in Congress. Not a protest against the Tories, a protest against, to be honest, the equivalent of Jeremy Corbyn. A protest of 200 people. 200 young people occupying their offices until the police were called <laughs> to clear them, demanding millions and millions and millions of green drops to do something about climate now. And Ocasio Cortez and uh, the other representative went to that occupation, spoke to them, slapped hands with all of them. They did it because they represent a mass movement of people. Of that it's not a mass movement of the left. It's a mass movement largely of those people who don't yet know that they are the left. <laughs> and may turn out to be a new thing with a new name. <laughs> but it's a mass movement. But also, there, was, there were 200 young people <laughs> from a much larger organization in California, the Sunrise Movement, determined to do something. We, um, we have to have that in our language in one minute. I'll take two if I might, just two. I want to end with how all this is connected up, and then we'll take two minutes. The way it's all connected up is the speed of what is happening is enormous. The threat to human life, the threat of millions and millions of refugees, hundreds of millions of refugees, tens of millions dead of war, of famine, and so on, that threat is before us now. We are beginning to see it in some parts of our the world right before us now. As climate change takes off, as it becomes a non-linear process, um, a runaway process, that will be, I have not hope it may be within my lifetime, which is not that long now. Um, we're, we're going to hit a terrible situation. That is happening, but people know. 
The, the right is on the march. And the right is on the march with the votes of ordinary people, working class people. And the reason that is, the deep reason that is, is because the left, or us, or the Greens, or whatever you call us, we have not give, delivered to people when we have elected governments, they have not given ordinary people what ordinary people need. That's the truth. It's the circumstances of our lived lives. If you're black, if you're an immigrant, if you're a leftist, if you're a green, you don't get to vote for the racists. But the racists organize by taking people's deep and visceral resentment at their situation and that nothing has been done for them. For people like us, nothing has been done. What we have to have now, we have to have governments of the left, produced by, influenced by, changed by mass movements of the left, that demand and win actual, substantive, important change to people's lives. Key to that, absolutely key to that, is stopping climate change. If we can stop climate change, if we can have globally what those people in that city and close to office are demanding, if we can have millions and millions and millions of green jobs, we can stop climate change. We can give people jobs all over the world. We can give black people and immigrant people and Muslim people and white people and Christian people and people don't believe in anything. We can give people jobs. We can stop climate change. We can say, on that basis, we can beat the right. We can fight the right. The last thing to say is, the last week I've been reading about feminists in China who are enormously brave and now enormously influential. They built a mass feminist movement against sexual harassment in situations of arrest, in situations where they're underground, but a mass national They've done it with what I think we have to do in every country. We have to have three things. First of all, in the, what we're facing in climate terms, what we're facing in the March of the Right, we have to have daily. We have to have being willing to imagine a different world and to go for it. The second thing is so clear for the Chinese feminists, but it's true for the rest of us too. We have to have courage. You can be absolutely intimidated by the scales of the increasing climate change. You can be absolutely intimidated by the right, by Donald Trump, by Putin, by, by all the people who voted for Brexit in Britain and in Scotland because they were voting for racism. They knew that's what they were doing. They thought that's what they were doing. Well, you can be intimidated and be held back. We have to have courage. We also have to have endurance. We have to be part. We don't know where the movement that breaks the hold of the right comes from. As I said, in the United States, it came from the women, and it came from sexual harassment and rape. We don't, we don't know where it comes from, but we do know that when those people are elected, <laughs> we have to have a mass movement for climate jobs. We have to bring those things together. It can be done. It is the task next 20 years. If we don't do it, we face in the times of my, your children, my grandchildren, we face a terrible, terrible time. If we do do it, we face a world where people have decided that our central task in the world is to share and to take care of each other as human beings. I think now, after South Africa, after the United States, my experience is there, I think we can do that. I don't know that we will, but I think that we can. And that is our task, our job together. Thank you.